and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. The 2023 elections are almost upon us, and however we choose to describe the upcoming polls, boring will not be one of the adjectives. Take, for instance, Enugu, the quiet coal city and capital of the former Eastern region. Its politics has been dominated by the People's Democratic Party, which has produced every governor since the return of democracy in 1999. To maintain peace and stability, the party and state adopted the rotation of the governorship seat among the three senatorial zones of the state, which also represents the sub-ethnic groupings within it. By the end of Governor Ifanyi Ugwai's tenure, the political rotation would be complete, each senatorial zone having produced a governor. But to what end? Has that really produced the sort of governance which the people of Enugu yearn for? What criteria would make or mar the election this time around? And do other political parties stand a chance in 2023? On hard copy tonight, I speak with Frank Wenke Jr., a two-time minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and governorship candidate on the platform of the All Progressives Grand Alliance. Frank Winke Jr., welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you, Mopi. It's good to be here. It was a pretty swift defection from the People's Democratic Party. I imagine that you've been a member of the party since 1999, or perhaps at, least at the time when you were appointed minister in the Obasanjo government. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, so you haven't thought about changing membership until March this year when you eventually defected to the All Progressives Grand Alliance. Well, not that I hadn't thought about it. So it was long in uh, coming in the last seven years, yeah. um, largely on account of um, the uh, very, very poor performance of the incumbent uh, PDP administration in the state. And um, also, um, you know, further encouraged by my, a sense that the, even the PDP as a party has lost its soul, right? Even and, within the state? Uh, even outside the state, even nationally, yes. uh, to my mind, right? And so um, it's always very important for you to, I mean, let's, let's, be, let's be, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's supposed to be a frank conversation, right? Yeah. Uh, politics is about interest, right? Whether it is personal or group interest. And um, on this occasion, I want to look at, um, I would like just to look at it from a, a group interest perspective. And so as a Southeasterner, for instance, right, I'm asking myself as to this party at the national level? Has this party been fair? Has this party been um, faithful to its uh, norms and traditions? Has this party been uh, faithful to even its own constitution, its own, uh, you know, uh, documents, uh, you know, that guide its operations and its existence? And my answer is no. And I believe that majority of the people from, my, uh, from, from uh, the southeast part of this country will uh, agree with me. But leave the national apart, right? Let's come to the state. Okay. Indeed, because they say all politics is local. It's very, very local. And so I look at it, in the last seven years, Enugu State has never, it's never been as filthy as it is today. It's a PDP government. In the past seven years, there's been no concerted efforts, or if there has been concerted effort, the results are not manifest. Uh, uh, effort by the, uh, by the PDP government, uh, uh, led by the incumbent governor, to uh, uh, resolve the water crisis that has plagued Enugu for decades. There's been no concerted efforts. There's been no and consultation. I mean, there was no consultation even when you were within the party to see how, you know, they could solve some of these so, problems or so, bring it to the attention of so, the person who was holding no, no, sway so, at the and, time. And so I can assure you that his predecessor did make remarkable effort. And then even... Uh, That's Governor, Sullivan Chime. Yeah, Sullivan Chime. Even uh, Governor Namani, you know, uh, worked assiduously as a former governor at the time to really uh, bring about um, uh, improvements in the water situation in Enugu. It was under Governor Namani, for instance, that the uh, Oji Water Works, um, a multi-million dollar project at the time, was, um, was uh, commissioned to boost water supply to Enugu. But the, 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 unfortunately, the, the, the incumbent government uh, has neither uh, provided, um, has neither initiated uh, any expansion program, nor has he or has his government been able to even uh, sustain the existing uh, water works. And so there's a major, major water crisis that is there in Enugu. Okay. And then you look at the state of um, industry generally, okay, whether it's uh, from a government uh, perspective or even from the perspective of the uh, private sector. And you have so many investors that have expressed deep regret 
that it came to Enugu at a time when the incumbent government uh, is, in, is in power. So, is, so that, is that a function of the party, <coughs> or that's a function of the man at the helm of affairs? The, the, party, the party has a responsibility to hold its representatives accountable, mm -hmm. right? It has got to be clear. You come to power on the basis of uh, contestation on the platform of a political party. And so if you are governor, you are the chief representative of this party. You carry the mandate of that party. You are the one that is flying the flag of that party. You are implementing the party manifesto on behalf of the party as governor, as whatever else you are called. And so nobody in that position can be exculpated from responsibility. No party can also be exculpated from responsibility in the performance, uh, in a, in the performance of, of its representative. It's got to be clear, right? Uh -huh. that, would... is, that is right. But yes. then, you know, some people will argue that within the party, there have been times when within a party, you know, perhaps a governor is at the helm of affairs. He doesn't do very well. When the governor, another governor comes on board within that same, or from that same party, he does better. Why haven't you chosen to continue to run the platform of the PDP? And so I have not chosen, I've chosen not to run Oh, I chose not to run on the platform of the PDP because I speak to the integrity of this party as a whole, right? I speak to this integrity, the integrity of this party as a whole. And you cannot delink PDP Enugu from PDP National. You cannot do that. It's a whole party. It's a whole party, right? And then more importantly, more importantly, on account of the very, very, you know, uh, bad situation that is uh, in our state today, right? I, I really, really then began to reflect on what this party really stands for. And when you, when you look at its, its manifesto and vis-a-vis -vis that of, say, the All Progressive Grand Alliance, there's something about the All Progressive Grand Alliance that speaks to what I call the Igbo worldview, right? Its development philosophy is anchored on what is called being our brother, be your brother and your sister's keeper, right? In Igbo, it is oyana one near. Literally, it's almost do not leave your brother or your sister behind. Some people think that, you know, you have a more national outlook. And I think a part of the criticisms against Afghan is that it has not been able to rise above regional politics, you know, <coughs> to a more national space. How do you take on that criticism? Let me remind you, Mopwe, that Pitobi, who is now the toast, or appears to be the toast of the country, was first elected on that platform of Afghan. Indeed, and yes. that's why that's what and, people and, point to. Let, let me let me make yes. a, a mm -hmm. point there, mm -hmm. and that's what a number of people point to: the fact that he was governor to two-term governor yes. on the platform of Abga, mm -hmm. but that it was seen that because the party couldn't grow beyond that, he left to the PDP uh, to pursue a more national ambition, uh, and that hasn't quite worked out within the PDP. He's left as well, and he's now with the Labour Party. Uh, well, I, I do not know if you would have thought, I mean, if you think that, you know, he's going to Labour Party, maybe now, be more acceptable, I don't know, you know. Uh, but he's had to look for a more national platform, so to speak. Uh, parties don't grow themselves, right? It is human beings that grow parties, okay? Peter Obi was first elected on the platform of APGA. And when he was elected, that party was barely a year old. He spoke volumes that at the peak of the PDP ascendancy or power in this country, if this people of this state chose that, listen, we want to elect this gentleman on this platform because we are comfortable having him on this platform. Was it okay. really barely a year old? Because barely I mean, a year old at the I, time. I, I remember, I mean, we all remember who the mm. founder of Abga is, Odume, mm. Odume Ujuku, I mean, was the founder of the party. Um, and he had sufficient clout in the Southeast to have been able to see the party through. Uh, but it would seem uh, that, you know, despite his um, acceptability, the party was still largely seen as a regional party. I and think there, that's not, Listen, uh, Mope, yeah. there's nothing wrong with being a regional party. Mm -hmm. Alliance for Democracy was a regional party. Action Congress was a regional party. Action Congress of Nigeria was a regional party. Mm -hmm. But at some point, what did they do? They formed a partnership. So it's important that you understand that trajectory, right? That you consolidate at home, right? And then reach out, right? As a viable route to power. And so I honestly believe that the southeast of Nigeria would have to really, really rethink their place in Nigeria in terms of politics. And I believe that the salvation for the southeast lies in building that regional political power block.
The people who are assessing the uh, tenor of Governor Ifan Yokoin, they think that you know, if you to look at the general insecurity pervading uh, the country, the Southeast has had its own peculiar problem, but somehow Enugu has been insulated from it. I mean, you don't hear a lot of um, IPOB um, problems in, in Enugu, for instance. Uh, the, the kidnappings, etc., that you know, you generally will hear in many parts of the country and south, south, southeast, uh, you hardly hear. It would seem that there is a toga of peace somewhat um, in Enugu. Is it a view that you will agree with? And so um, the fact that you don't hear about it does not mean that things don't happen there, okay? That's, that's, a, that's a fact. And if you, uh, if you care to scan the news uh, uh, properly, you find that there has been a series of incidents, right, of uh, kidnaps, uh, kidnapping, of, um, of uh, attacks, you know, um, across the state, um, the, uh, the menace of unknown gunmen. Uh, These things are pervasive. Comparatively and, yes. to so, other parts of the Southeast. Mm, yeah, comparatively uh, to other to parts Anambra, of the Southeast. Anambra, for instance, mm -hmm. or Imo, for instance, mm -hmm. Enugu has been largely quiet. I don't know whether quiet is the word. I do not. I don't know about quiet. Okay. I mean, of course, the 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 these incidences. Okay. Even if it's just one. Okay. It just really, really uh, drives fear into uh, the human psyche, and so citizens are terrified, and so people don't want to even uh, venture out. And if that is what you call peace, then um, uh, good for you. But that cannot be uh, peace enough. That cannot be the basis of uh, such uh, assumptions that um, the state is quiet, mm -hmm. okay? Because people are so too terrified to even carry on economic activities. People are too terrified to go out at night and people are too terrified to even do things that they would normally do in the course of their normal life. That is the fact of the matter, okay? That is a fact of the matter. So you do not agree that Enugu has been peaceful? Enugu could even be more peaceful than it is now, right? Enugu would be more peaceful if people were able to go about their normal activities, if businesses would thrive, if investors would come, right? If unemployment was reduced, if the water crisis was resolved, okay? If roads were fixed, if economic activities could just go, go on in the, as, 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 as should be the case in a normal uh, state or in the normal course of human life. Mm. Uh, but then, you know, talking about the politics in Enugu uh, mm. generally, um, it has largely managed some stability, um, rotating the governorship seat among the three senatorial zones. Mm. And I know that there's been some argument as to whether or not they should go back to the very first senatorial zone where uh, Governor Chimaro Kim Inamani came from or whether they should. I know that a group of professionals wrote from the U.S. asking that, you know, this time around, since it's been around on the senatorial zones, merit should be what should count. Um, I do not know what conversations you're hearing, but how strongly do you think this, um, this balancing act is going to affect your chances um, in Enugu? Okay, so Maupe, I, I want to look at this question from the perspective of um, the peculiarities uh, of every democracy in the world, right? And so um, uh, I believe that because of the diversity of our nation and the diversity of most states of you know, Nigeria, um, I believe that we have a responsibility as a nation and as a, you know, as a nation to really um, evolve the kind of democracy that will work for us. And so in Enugu State, it is not different, all right? And, but for that understanding, as far back as 2007, when I was in the federal cabinet, toward, at the, at, towards the end of the administration, President Obasanjo wanted me to run for the office of governor of Enugu State. But I had to patiently explain to him that where I come from, there is a zoning arrangement. And so first it was Governor Okwesile Zemwondo, and then it went to Governor Chimaroke Namani, and from Governor Chimaroke Namani, it went to Governor Sullivan Chime from in the West. And then from the West, it went to the North again. And so it has swung back again to the Enugu Eastern Trial Zone where Chimaroke comes from and where I also come from and where the, the, the candidate of the People's Democratic Party also comes from because of that understanding, right? Now, let me say this. It may not 
have, you know, I, I feel that our democracy will evolve ultimately to a point where it may not matter where you come from. But there are a lot of sensitivities about your identity, inclusion of your people, quality of representation they have, that sense of justice and fairness. And let me explain something to you. There's something fueling it. You know what is fueling it? What is fueling it is perhaps the inability of political rep of representatives at any point in time to really see an entire area, a state, as their constituency. Um, right now, we know that uh, the budget of um, Enugu State trends between uh, 186.64 billion. I think that's the budget for this year. For last year, it was 169.85. If you look at that of neighboring Anambra, it does look like they are within the same region. I think mm. the budget for 2022 mm. for Anambra mm. was 170 billion. But you had pretty strong words and you have a pretty ambitious plan uh, for what you'd like to do for Enugu State. Uh, you've talked about how government has not been able to sustain many industries. Adar rice, cashew processing industry, sunrise flour mills, aluminum industry, um, pea grip farm, okutu, you know, all of this, you say, uh, you know, currently not in the state that they ought to be. What do you, how do you perceive, coming from the private sector, how do you perceive the role of the private sector in government? And do you really see a role for government in business? Okay, thank you very much. Now, let me uh, just be clear, right? Um, in the 21st century, um, one could look at this issue from two perspectives, okay? What is the role of government in business? The role of government at this point in time is, let me borrow that cliche, to create an enabling environment for investors to come in, for businesses to be set up, and for these businesses to thrive. That is what government should focus on. So if you perceive okay. the role of government, mm, yes. <laughs> excuse me, as that of an yes. enabler, are you surprised that this business has okay, so, crashed? Uh, so, so I'm coming. Now, um, so there are businesses that were set up around the same time which are still working, okay? Which are still working. Now, if you, the, the document you referred to, if you looked at the context, right, there was a context around it. What was that context? A lot of these businesses that you refer to today were set up by the old Eastern Regional Government. And why did they do these things? They did it because they understood that in order for them to create economic prosperity, right, it was important for these private entities to be established. And that's why I make the distinction between, say, the 21st century and then the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And so, but there are also certain kinds of businesses, even now, certain sectors, for instance, in which government may choose to take the lead, perhaps because of the high, uh, um, uh, maybe because of the strategic nature of such, of such a sector, and because government needs to sort of encourage pr private investors, partner with them, or encourage them to come in, because being part of it, certain things will be guaranteed. But subsequently, such a government may need to divest completely or just remain there as a shareholder, but not an active participant, so that they don't constitute a drag to the business, okay? So for me, my preference is for government to create an environment that will enable these businesses to come in and then to thrive, all right? What about the old businesses? Do you have any, are you going to do anything about them? Do you intend to revive them? Do you intend to sell them off? Yeah, so, so there are some of these uh, businesses right now that, you know, because of the, um, the, the failure of government to, uh, to, to protect them, right, uh, have, 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 have literally um, uh, all crashed, okay? So if you look at, say, the, um, the plantations that we have, if you look at the farm settlements like Adarise, for instance, I mean, have we stopped eating, right? Have we stopped eating? We have not stopped eating, but that, that farm lies fallow. So much can be done. There's a dam there. There's a dam there. How about the poultry? What do you need to really resuscitate, uh, resuscitate a pigry or resuscitate a poultry? What do you need to do? What do you really need to do? And so for me, there's, some of these things will be done because I consider them to be low-hanging fruits. And I consider them that they're critical for food security. They are critical for, to catalyze economic activities and to really create huge employment opportunities. 
Do you really think that governors can make a difference? I know that you've argued in the past. I just I got a part of your speech from the 2014 National Conference. You talked about how you support a political and economic system which will devolve power to the regions on mutually agreeable terms. Uh, you, you talk about how that would lead to greater accountability and faster economic development, but then there are you know, there have been questions as to how much governors can do. In the current security situation, um, even as federating units, people think that they're not really, uh, I think it was a senator from your state who coined the term feeding bottle uh, federation. That's uh, Senator Ike Um That is currently where a number of governors are. They, they think that they've been hampered, that they could do so much more if, you know, there was... Uh, true restructuring and a devolution of powers. Uh, so from where you stand and from your knowledge of how you know the Nigerian state works, do you really think that governors can really make a difference? In our country today, um, I believe that there are states where the governors have made a very strong uh, difference. Do not ask me to name the states. But there are states where the governors have made a very, very strong difference. But I'm going to even digress a bit and then come bring you back to what I consider to be issues of leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Whether it's in the home, whether it's in an office, whether it's in a community, whether it's in a nation. A leadership that is visionary, a leadership that is disciplined, a leadership that is responsible a leadership that understands is a reason for being. Why were you elected? Why were you appointed? What are you doing here as this leader, in quote? I have a problem with that term, on that appellation. Because I've often said that being in a position of authority does not mean that you are a leader at all. There are two different things, but people have often mixed them up. So there's so much difference that leaders can make at the state level. Money plays a great role in all of this. Are you prepared to run the money politics, uh, which will most likely also shape the 2023 elections? Can you please throw a light on this money politics that you're talking about? What do you mean money politics? Are you going to pretend that you're not aware that money does play a great role in terms of how um, leaders emerge, um, and even how they, you know, eventually are elected. Okay, so, um, good question, and, um, well, I can assure you that where I'm coming from in uh, Abga, um, um, we've had fairly, fairly transparent processes leading up to where we are today, mm -hmm. right? Um, on the other hand, we've heard... Uh, I've, I've, I've read certain comments attributed to uh, the opposition party, uh, the incumbent party, where um, there was some suggestion that a certain amount of money was paid for the current governorship. Now, I, I must confess that I, I don't have proof of this. I, I read it and I made that reference. And then in conversations, this thing has come up again and again and again. And there was even insinuation that uh, the current ticket uh, may have been uh, auctioned uh, for a certain fee. Now, these were things that I, I read, is that, you know, attributed to certain people. I have no proof of it, and so and I'm relaying it as such. And it didn't so, inform your choice of leaving the PDP? Um, I, 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 did, I mean, I'm aware of the kinds of things that may go on there, but because I wasn't part of that process with them, I cannot, I'm not in a position to really authenticate or whatever uh, may have gone on there, but I will not be surprised. And so the question for you is, or if I was a, a voter today, I am a voter, the question that must be put to this electorate is whether you want to allow a situation where your state is being traded, your state is a commodity, your future is a commodity, your education sector has become a commodity, your security sector has become a commodity, Social infrastructure has become a commodity because people sit somewhere and just decide to put an auction on the state and decide, oh, this is how much it is worth, and then it is sold to the highest bidder, right? Now, Mopi, irrespective of the outcome of the uh, 2023 elections, 
I want to say that I would my head high anywhere in this country on account of my record of service and on, on account of what I believe in, my, my, my philosophy of uh, public service, which is people-centered, which is a service that is underscored by integrity and very strong values. That is what I will always hold on to. Nothing is going to make me change it. Even then, and so, and you, so, you, and so for me, yeah. so for me, right, we are marketing our party, we are pushing our manifesto. I was going to say that are, even then, you will need money to run your campaign. No, of course, of course, we need money to run our campaign, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we've had the benefit of extremely um, uh, generous people who also desire change, very well-meaning citizens who desire change who believe that we cannot continue in the way that uh, we are currently uh, are going because the state risks uh, collapse, um, you know, uh, in, if things were to continue this way. Of course, right? But what I thought you were alluding to is this uh, whole thing about, you know, you need to bribe everybody in order for them to agree with you. I, I would do no such thing. Because, listen, on one hand, electorate wants good governance. Then on one hand, you want a situation where oh, they, you are going to be paid off, right? With the money they're using, paying you off, where is it going to come from? Frank McKay Jr., thank you for coming on Hard Copy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Well, that's the program tonight. To let us know what your thoughts are using the handles on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Good night.